to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to get back in the book of Isaiah again today. 38, 15. Remember, Hezekiah, after God adding 15 years to his life, finally, finally, Hezekiah learns to consult the Father before he makes moves. You should, anytime you leave God out of the equation of your life, friend, you're in trouble. I mean, you may not know it, and you may just think you have a troubled life, but it's so much um, more comfortable in life to make sure our Father is kept in your equa the equation of your uh, planning stages, uh, looking ahead, ask Him. Ask Him to guide you through your own mind to right decisions or, like Hezekiah, stumble and fall in it, friend. It's up to you. It's your choice. But finally, Hezekiah has learned his lesson when God saved the whole city, Jerusalem, from the Assyrian, which was simply a type of the spurious Messiah. Having said that, we're in that letter that Hezekiah wrote. It's a song, actually. It's kind of what some would call part of the Song of Degrees. Uh, chapter 38, verse 15, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Let's go with it. Hezekiah continues, What shall I say, question? He hath both spoken unto me, and himself hath done it. God did it, yes. I shall go softly all my ears to the bitterness of my soul. Um, he remembers the... Um, um, he remembers, if, you know, his dependence on Yah now. That's what basically he's saying. And it's good when you depend upon God. It makes life a lot easier for you. 16, O Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit. That spirit is your intellect, each one's intellect. So wilt thou recover me and make me to live. That is to say, live eternally. God is the God of the living, not the dead. There is only one life other than you might have a few years, a few score years here on earth. If that's all you got, friend, you don't have much. For life is eternal, and that is that is why Eve would say, be called the mother of all living, because through her would come the Christ, which paid the price for we sinners, whereby we can be brought into eternal life. And, um, and so it is. There were many other mothers and many other peoples that God had created, all of the races, on the sixth day. And, uh, of course, Eve came forth on the eighth day. And through that stem come, came Messiah. God is the God of the living, not the dead. You know something? Not even Satan is dead now. No one has spiritually, understand what I'm saying, has been sentenced to death to the point the spirit snuffed out. Okay? Only God can do that. Man can't. Verse 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but... Thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Our Father is so forgiving. We can mess up and, I mean, bring ourselves to such a point that it's pitiful. Hezekiah actually had. He was responsible. He was the leader. And he about led the whole nation into chaos until he finally remembered, I better talk to God. Instead, he depended on man. Go and get old Pharaoh, help me out of this. And Pharaoh, uh, like always, you can't trust men. And 
there, the Assyrian was at his door. Who stopped him? God did. Killed 185 of them in one night. You can call it a plague or whatever you want to. God got it done and saved Hezekiah from um, his uh, downfall. After his repentance, God, God is so forgiving. And you know, isn't a parent always forgiving of a child when they know indeed they're repentant? Well, our father is no different. All he wants from his children is love. That is to say, he wants you to love him. And that forgiveness is going to flow. Verse 18, for the grave cannot praise thee. Uh, grave is most often uh, translated hell, okay? So you can have it either way. Death cannot celebrate thee. Why? You've got victory over both. Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? Or vice versa, which is it? I'm trying to quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about verse 54. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. In other words, you leave God's truth out of your life, you're headed for the pit. You know what the pit is? That's the abyss. That's hell. In other words, that's the blotting out. That's the lake of fire. Verse 19, the living, the living, given two times for emphasis. So I want to get your attention. The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. I don't know. Do you help people out? Now, I'm not telling you to become a religious fanatic, stand on the street corner and shout. And, but I mean, when a friend is in trouble, when they're at a point of life that they need a word of encouragement. You know, if you have the knowledge from God's word, you can certainly be a comfort to them. And, and that's what God expects. That's what a family is for. I'm talk, speaking of a Christian family. And quite frankly, the subject of death, grave, and hell. If, if you understand how God handles those situations, when a family has lost a loved one, you can be a great comfort to let them know you're not actually sticking that person in a hole in the ground, that their spiritual body is already gone. It's with the Father. You can be a great, the living, the living. Understand and be able to teach what it means to live to be alive. Again, I, I'm repeating myself. God is not the father of the dead, but of the living. All right. He's the God of the living. Verse 20. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. And I understand that many of the songs of degrees are Hezekiah is given the credit for that. And a uh, regular little old musician, all right? Uh, many of the Psalms. Verse 21, for Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs. Remember, he was, about to, he was at death's door. Take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil, and he shall recover. You know, it's... Uh, Natural medicine is an interesting thing, is it not? There would be some that would say, well, it was the fig cake that healed him, not God. Oh, well, that was the message from our Father. What is the deeper truth he wants you to know? This is all types of how it will be at the end. And when it speaks of a healing of your mind, you'd better have the parable of the fig tree plastered right in your mind. You better know it. Jesus didn't say, if you get around to it, would you learn the parable of the fig tree? He said, learn it. It's important. There is no way you can understand prophecy without understanding the parable of the fig tree. It's very healing to the mind as well as the body, 22. Hezekiah also said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? And of course, you will find that written in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 8. I'll repeat it. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 8. What was the sign? The sun reversed. 
right? Only God could do that. Anyone can say we lost 20 minutes, it moved forward. And actually, through NASA, now we know there is a day missing. And um, uh, so, therefore, that in itself, we always find God's word is true. Uh, Hezekiah. Well, he had a, was he a good man? Well, he tried to be. But unfortunately, he's like a lot of us. He had big problems. He depended on man until he was almost dead. And then he finally turned to God. At least brought God into, he, he could have asked God. He could have said, Father, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down to Pharaoh in Egypt because we don't have any horses. We don't have any cavalry. We don't have any chariots. And, and allowed God to speak because God did not defeat Sennacherib with chariots. He defeated him by the word, 185,000 of them. Okay. You can learn a lot in the, from this next chapter to help your own life. Listen carefully. Chapter 39, verse 1. At that time, Muradak Baladan, that means worshiper of Baal, he's a Baal worshiper, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered. Oh, I was a sick puppy, all right. I just a death bed. And this nice man has sent me a get well card. Oh, that wonderful king of Babylon. Now you see, the Assyrian, I want, you, I want you, you better, you better think deep for a moment. The Assyrian is a type of the false messiah. But if you've ever studied the book of Revelation, you know that the king of Babylon is his final title. Babel meaning confusion, bringing confusion upon the world. So here we got, you might say the king of Babel or Babylon sent him a get well card and he's thrilled to death about it. And just praising God for his healing and God having loved him. Look how quick he can, you know, God, uh, my whole point, that I, the point I want to make in this, God gave you a brain, use it. Okay, this wasn't one of our people. This is basically an enemy. Just because an enemy sends you a get well card, don't get all carried away. Verse, uh, two, I mean, you can appreciate it, but look, look to the point Hezekiah, get, Hezekiah gets carried away. He's, he had a brain, but he didn't use it all that often. He, he could be impressed pretty easy because he liked to play the, the man. All right, verse 2. And Hezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor. Well, this is what we got to fight with right here. And all that was found in his treasures, I'm a very, I am rich. There's just one problem. It didn't belong to him. It belonged to God. And God doesn't want his pretty showed off to the enemy. There was nothing in his house nor in all his kingdom that Hezekiah showed them not. I mean... It, Again, it wasn't his. It belonged to God. I'm not, I, I, I'm sure you can understand here when you study the book of Daniel after the king of Babylon actually took uh, Judah uh, captive. And they brought out some of these vessels from the treasure, you know, from the, from the house rather. And God did, wouldn't have it. He wouldn't let that bunch of heathen drink from those sacred vessels. And that's when many, many tickle came into being, all right? And uh, Babylon, I mean, he was, well, he was so bad that it loosed his loins and the whole business, all right? It scared him when God put the hand on the wall. But I, I'm sure th this is where the vessels came from. I mean, show them all the purdies. I have done this. 
Let me tell you something, friend. I, you know, so quick has he recovered. And he doesn't give God credit, really, deep down in his, he's not using his brain, all right? There is a great war between Satan and Christ, between our Father and that cherubim. Don't ever let your guard down by sweet words. Verse 3, Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? Question. What are they doing here? What did they say to you? And from whence came they unto the question? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country unto me, even from Babylon. Isaiah, don't you know? They, they, they love me so much, they travel over deserts and hills and great distance, and they came all that way to see me. And I, I'm... I'm Perhaps I'm overplaying it, but I don't think so. I want you to see it. You, you're a lot better off in your life if you leave a lot of me and I out of it, all right? Verse 4. Then said he, What have they seen in thine house? Question. And Hezekiah answered, All that is in mine house. <laughs> yeah, have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. I mean, I wanted to impress them, Isaiah. I wanted them to know. Well, beloved, you know, that's just like turning your throat to the enemy. And I hope you understand what that figure of speech means. When you turn your throat to your enemy, he can cut it, all right? In other words, you weaken yourself. Verse 5, Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Again, God gave us a brain. Always use it. Keep it in gear, friend. Leave the eyes and me's out of it and use your brain and, uh, and that God has given you, and you'll be a lot better off. Verse 6, Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried to Babylon, nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. I mean, even the old brazen sea tanks out front, finally they got around to it. First took the gold, then on each uh, of the sieges, all three of them, they kept taking what was left, including the people, seven. <clears throat> Excuse me. And thy sons, they shall issue from, that uh, shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, he hadn't begat them yet even, shall take away, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, on and on it goes. I mean, the sons of Judah, the princes of Judah, right there to serve the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. When God speaks, it comes to pass. And some are going to say, well, Anyone could have done that. That was years ago. Well, how about the time in Psalms 22 when he, it wrote of the crucifixion that did not take place until at least uh, 600 and say so odd years after this. And it even speaks of down to the Roman soldiers gambling for his clothing. Man couldn't do that. God can. You got a brain. Use it. Think for yourself. Verse 8. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, this, this is kind of shocking in a way, listen to it. Good is the word of the Lord which has, thou hast spoken. He said, moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. You know, I have a little bit of trouble with that, um, being an old combat Marine. I, you know, what, what he's saying that's a good word because I'm gonna have, I've only got 15 years and I'm going to begat children in that time and I'm going to have it good. All this stuff is going to come on them. Well, I, you know, I, I don't really have a little trouble with that. I would think you would too. It seemed to me like he had a brain, but he most thought of me and I in more ways than one. And I'm not knocking him or judging him. God alone can judge, but I hope you use your brain a lot more to your advantage and for the protection of your offspring than this man did. 
I mean, have the enemy come to your doorstep saying, I hope you're not too sick. It's so wonderful you didn't die. Well, come in and let me show you everything I have. This is my armament that if I'm ever attacked, and certainly he would be by this people, this is what I have to defend myself. Well, certainly it doesn't take much of a, a military strategist to be able to overcome a limited amount of arms and so on and so forth to know exactly what you're fighting against. He had a brain. He didn't use it. That's the lesson I want you to learn from chapter 39. Always keep it in gear. And always, always put your father first and your family right there where you by you look to the future and you protect them. And then maybe after that, you got a little room for the me's and I's, and you'll be a lot better off. Chapter 40 and verse 1. Here we're going to go into, if you would, future prophecy. We're going to talk about Messiah. And verse 1 reads, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Do you understand that he wants you to be comforted? As a matter of fact, in later years, he would send the comforter, as it is written in St. John chapter 14. Two, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. Always watch that city, beloved. And cry unto her that her warfare, her hard surface, service is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Do you think that's come to pass yet? It has not. That is yet future from this time. There she is not resting from any type of war or anything else. It's, we're in that stage of the end times that she cries, peace, peace, peace. She's got no peace. Verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And of course, Matthew 3.3, 3, we know that this was John the Baptist as he would cry from the wilderness. But he, as he came in the spirit of Elijah, what is it? Luke chapter 1 verse 15 that declares that he was not John the Baptist, but that he came in the spirit of Elijah, all right? He would have been Elijah had they received him, but they cut his head off. I do not call that receiving him. Messiah would have only had one advent had they received him, but they crucified him. Uh, I guarantee you Messiah is returning, and I guarantee you they're not going to crucify him this time because he's not coming back as a babe to save the world. He's coming back as king of kings, and he will rule with a rod of iron, as it is written in the great book of Revelation. But this is that cry from the wilderness that the advent was near. And uh, certainly, as it is promised in Malachi, uh, chap Malachi chapter 4, uh, next to the last verse, that that uh, spirit of Elijah would return again, that Elijah himself, who was transformed, who would appear again in the New Testament, standing with Moses in front of Jesus Christ, would make that uh, announcement. Chapter, uh, verse 4. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. In other words, at that time, the going's going to be easy. There's going to be some changes. Why? The king is coming. The king's going to make it easy for everybody. You know, there are many things now that we must contemplate and have faith in to make the right decision. The leader will be here giving orders, much as he gives orders from the word. But the only way you can understand the order if you do not have... Um, a firm understanding of the manuscripts is kind of by trial and error. You know, it doesn't take, um, stupid is as stupid does, you know, it doesn't take you too long to use your brain enough to know when you're blessed, you're on the right path. When you're not blessed, I, I, I would open up, I would use that brain a little more in overtime and I would change my flight plan slightly. 
verse 5, according to the flight plan God has set forth. Verse 5, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. That, I mean, revealed, made obvious, plain sight, the Shekinah glory even, if you would. And all flesh shall see it together. You think that's come to pass? For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It has not happened, but it shall. It will not be until after the seventh trump either. All right, verse 6. The voice said, cry, that means shout. And he said, what shall I cry? What shall I shout? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. In other words, what's going to happen to the flesh? You might as well get it in your mind. We're through with it, and I don't think there will be too many complaints for that because we've got something far better waiting. That's a body that doesn't feel the pressures that you feel in a flesh body. Verse 7, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth. It can be beautiful, most beautiful. It's still going to fade. It's, it's perishable just as our flesh bodies are, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. So this, this is how fragile it is with man, beloved. And this is why using your brain, you'd better decide that eternal life is so valuable because you're in a testing period born innocent of woman to make your own mind up. No one else can do it for you. They can advise you, but whichever one you listen to, you did it on your own accord. So you're responsible for your own actions and decisions. And when you stand before him on judgment day, you will answer for yourself. That's why you must never put your trust in man as Hezekiah did, but put your trust in God. And it doesn't hurt to listen to a man here and a man there, but you had better thee well check him out in God's word because there are a lot of blowhards entered into the world, especially claiming to be teachers of the gospel and of prophecy and are nothing but a bunch of fakes. There's some good ones too, okay? But how do I know the difference? God's word. God spoke it. It's real. That's the way it's going down. If somebody tells you different, he's a liar, okay? Verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. It's never going to change. Do you know where this is written in the New Testament? Mark chapter 13. Man will change. God's word shall never change, not in this earth age, not from the first earth age, and not in the age to come. So all the time you spend in it is not wasted. It's going to be with us forever. And as far as Christ goes, Messiah, he is the word, the living word. Verse 9, O Zion that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that city of peace, that bringeth good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Uh, lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. This is going to be a wonderful time. A wonderful time. It's going to happen. I guess. The question God wishes you would want you to ask yourself is where are you going to be? Which side? Verse 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand. That wasn't the first advent, friend. And his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him, meaning the millennium. And we know, as it is written in the great book of Revelation, that he returns um, on that white horse, a, a charger, a victor, and he rules with a rod of iron. Not, would you please, poor me baby, comes as correction. 
Do you realize that in the Old Testament, both advents are spoken of in one of the minor prophets? A lot of people say, well, it never says there would be two advents in the Old Testament. Oh, yes, it does. It just did. It speaks of the voice of John the Baptist pre uh, announcing his coming as a babe. And in this verse, it speaks of him coming with power from on high and a warrior, a victor. You'll read it in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. He comes riding a lowly ass in verse 9. As Hosanna, save us now, they would cry to him. But in verse 10, he, at the end of the world, he comes on a white stallion, so to speak, as a conqueror. So um, our Father's word is complete. Do you have complete understanding? I wish one of us did. We don't, but we're working at it. Never quit. Never give up. And when you run across somebody that thinks they know it all, guess what? You're talking to a fool. Our Father's word is pregnant, and it continues to grow as he reveals as we move closer toward the end. Never tire of working, using your brain to have a better understanding and to be more pleasing unto him. His reward is with him. What is, who, who collects a reward? Those that earn it. Do you understand that even, even one in the flesh that isn't living at this time, and it's going to happen in this generation, quite frankly, because we're in the generation of the fig tree. That's why he would have you know from verse 21 of the last chapter, you better learn the fig tree, the parable, that is to say. But um, uh, when he comes, then as it, also as it is written in Revelation chapter, what is it, 14, verse 13, that your works is all that can go with you. All, all else is written in the great book of life. And your works is what you're judged by, and his reward is the good payday to those that have served him. Otherwise, you got some people that probably don't have anything. Bunch of naked jaybirds, verse 11, baby jaybirds, that is. Verse 11, and we'll complete for this particular lecture. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. That means with love, with understanding. His sheep will know his voice and he will know his sheep. He shall gather the lambs with his arms, pick them up gently when they're in trouble, and carry them in his bosom, nurture them, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Our Father loves his children. He gently will lead you. He knows your needs. But you know something? There, I'm, I'm sure there are some will say, well, why hadn't he ever helped me? Because you haven't asked. You haven't asked right. Because you're his child and he loves you. He wants to lead you. He wants to protect you. But you go pulling one of those Hezekiahs, like showing all your pretties to the enemy. He doesn't want anything to do with you. He's going to rip you off everything you have and give it to somebody that uses his brain. And I hope you're not like Hezekiah. Well, as long as it's my children and not me. And I, I, sounds like I'm knocking Hezekiah. I'm not. He was a human being. We all fall short. But, and God used him as a lesson to us. Don't let it happen to you. You were given some gray matter up here. It was right between your ears. Well, basically, use it. Absorb God's word. Just because someone else made a mistake, you don't have to make the same one. And always ask your father for guidance and to assist you in in making the right decision. Do you think God can't change minds? You just read of it in the last lecture. Old Sennacherib was, I mean, he was licking his chops already. He had Jerusalem surrounded. He had more than enough uh, uh, armor and otherwise to take the city. Do you know how God did? He changed his mind. All he did was whisper in old Sennacherib's ear and said, 
your house is about to burn and your family and your kids are going down with it and there's an enemy army taking your home and your nest and your family, your kids and all your pretties. Guess what Sennacherib did? He got Jerusalem out of his mind in a hurry. He did an about face and his own kids killed him not long after that. You see, God can change minds. That's why when you have a loved one that you know is going wrong. If you pray for anything, pray that God will change their mind. Okay? Or wake it up. Give them a little common sense. That's, that's a good way to pray uh, when, you've, when you've done all you can do or a mate or whatever. You have a brain, use it. We are, Christianity is not a religion. It's a reality and you live in a real world you answer for those things that you're responsible for, and if you mess up once, log it away and don't do it again, all right? Learn and grow, and God will begin to make the way smooth for you and blessed. Oh, you're always gonna have a little, Satan's got your number, quite frankly, and he'll try, but he won't have any luck, all right? You have the victory in Christ. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer.